uh, we see some familiar faces from uh, the CS3 on double zero course. Uh, good to have you here. And uh, yeah, I also see a few people who are uh, but not uh, uh, not particularly sure. Um, okay, so this is a very small class, right? So uh, I would like this to be interactive, right? So if I uh, I think uh, that's the benefit of having the small small classes. I can actually, uh, I think 3.0 was also interactive, but I expect all of you to sort of uh, ask questions as and when it comes to your mind, right? So feel free, put me in a spot, right? So you should you should be like, okay, let's put uh, Casey in a spot and uh, let's make him stumble, right? So I like that sort of uh, questions. Only then will I actually start to think, and um, it'll be fun, right? So it'll be much more fun that way. Um, so we have uh, eight plus two, ten people now. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so let uh, let us get started, right? So um, before I start, how many people are actually um, from uh, CS two double zero course? Can you sort of uh, turn on your webcam and then say, OK, so that's that's good as well. Raise your hand. OK, two, three, four. OK, okay wonderful. Uh, and how many people are uh, uh, haven't taken 3100? How many are like graduate students, masters, and PhD students? I know Shashin is. OK, one. And uh, Shashin also. OK, wonderful. Uh, three. OK, good. Um, Cool. So, what we can do, right? So, I hope that um, you've uh, seen the website. It's sort of uh, taken over from the previous uh, um, year's uh, website and then modified suitably. And even the constituency, constituent of this class, right? So, it looks like uh, many of you are um, actually familiar with a lot of the OCaml programming. Last time I've taught this course, uh, we had a lot of new students who were, who were get, getting started and playing around uh, with OCaml, but not uh, having gone through some of the early lectures. Given that majority of the students are going to be, um, have seen 300 and some of the stuff that we talked about, we are going to start off from that point, right? But uh, others don't feel left out. Right. If you really want to ask a question and say, OK, I really don't know what you're talking about, stop me. Right. I'm happy to explain uh, anything and everything in this course. But you have to ask. Right. I'm going to assume that uh, I'm going to you understand everything and I'm um, saying. But that's not true. Right. That's obviously not true. Um, so feel free to stop. Me. Uh, we may cover more stuff than the last time. Because uh, we lost a bunch of classes uh, last time because of uh, this interruption due to COVID, We're still in this phase. I hope everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy and uh, so on. And uh, hopefully, after this, uh, this uh, whole thing sort of uh, ties over, hope to see everyone of one of you physically. Right? Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Let me share my screen. You want to say something? Anyone that wants to say anything before uh, I start uh, uh, talking? Ah, uh, sir, uh, just one thing. Uh, yeah. The CS three one double zero course was like I am. I am currently in my eighth semester, so mm. it's been a while since I did the course. So okay. So that like I may not be completely fluent with the. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. But. Uh, Thanks for uh, raising that up, uh, Pranav. So what we are going to sort of uh, do is, uh, I'm not going to say, oh, we saw this in 3.0, I'll do this, right? I'm going to point to saying, OK, you've seen this previously in 3.0, here is how we do it. So I'm, I'm, I'll make sure that uh, uh, I don't skip important details, assuming that uh, you remember everything from the course. I forget uh, everything that was taught uh, the moment I write the exam. And I don't know more about you, but uh, that's what I happens to me. Um, so so we'll try to make sure that uh, every one of you uh, is accounted for. 
Okay, so let me make the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so this is program set proofs. Um, so as I mentioned at the website, this is a sort of a course that is, uh, uh, well, if you don't get anything from this course, right? It will sort of help you to think about um, programs differently. And what it will help you uh, do is uh, look at programs more rigorously. Right? So what uh, we will learn as part of the course is to sort of ask questions that we informally ask about programs. Right? So oh, here is a program that does uh, um, influence binary search tree deletion. Uh, and you have intuitive understanding of uh, the proofs and so on. But uh, what uh, this course will teach you is to equip you with um, tools to actually um, never hand wave, right? So that's the thing that uh, this will this course will teach you. So we sort of know uh, when doing proofs, right? Oh, we know this is obvious. We are uh, we are going to learn to um, forget that, right? So um, so if you even if you don't end up using anything from this course, what you will learn is to make you a better programmer by thinking about uh, specifications of programs and how do you deal with uh, making sure that uh, the program that you write is uh, true according to some specification that you have in mind. Right? You may not use the tools that we uh, teach here uh, directly, but uh, they should just help you write better programs uh, wherever you go. Right? Uh, not just program build systems or something, so they will help you to think about uh, the overall aspect of uh, software construction in a more rigorous way. Right? And that is the goal of this course. We will look at lots and lots of things in this course, but that's the thing that you have to keep in mind, right? So that's the takeaway from this course. So call it programs and proofs. Essentially, this is a program verification course, but um, uh, when we talk about verification, a lot of people um, have different meanings for what verification is. In particular, uh, if you talk to hardware folks, right, they will say, oh, I verified the hardware. I will ask them. I work with uh, a few of the folks from uh, the Shakti processor project, and they will say, we need to verify the um, uh, hardware, hardware uh, extensions for a processor. right?" I will say, OK, that sounds incredibly complex. What do you mean verification? I will say, OK, I run a battery of tests. right? And that's what I call verification. If you sort of say, oh, I'm doing testing, and I name it verification, that won't fly in this uh, community, right? So what we mean by verification in uh, in this course is like if you verified a program according to some specification, you have absolute guarantee that the program does not have any chronic cases, right? As you know, testing can only show the presence of bugs, not the absence of it. So we are not doing testing in this course. We are actually going ahead and going to verify programs. And that's why I don't use the word verification in um, uh, the title, so it's called Programs and Proofs. So the goal is to build reliable software, right? Every one of us want to build reliable software. And by reliable, it doesn't mean that uh, only big things have to be reliable. Even a simple program, I want to say delete a note from the linked list. right? I want to make sure that deletion actually works according to how the deletion should work. Right? You delete that node, all of the pointers are uh, left uh, uh, correctly in a double linked list. And that node is not there, and you don't change anything else, right? So these are the intuitive assumptions, and we want to build techniques where we can sort of go ahead and do this uh, in the small and large, right? So we will sort of uh, see techniques all through the way. So imagine you're running a software company, right? So you graduate and you sort of uh, go work for a company, or you found your own company doing exciting stuff, and uh, you're doing some um, moonshots, right? So let's just uh, call it that. So you put in 30 person years developing the next big thing. Maybe you're working for the Boeing, and you're verifying the flight controller of uh, uh, Dreamliner 2. As you know, before uh, these fly-by-wire systems, right, when uh, the pilot pulls a lever, there is hydraulics that make sure that uh, you sort of uh, change the flap um, ailer on setting or your flaps or something. 
there is a physical connection right that changes the angle of attack and so on but today all of the um, large commercial jets are fly by wire when you move a thing what happens is you actually send a signal right that is processed by software or a combination of software and hardware that actuates a controller at some point right there is some code even if it is not really code as you would think about it there is some code that is sitting in between the person who is moving who sends the commands and the actual actuation these are really really complex systems right so um, suppose you want to ensure that this uh, uh, flight controller is reliable or you might be building an autonomous uh, vehicle control software for tesla say you are driving a building a self driving uh, uh, system right this is the hot cake now everyone wants to build this as you know these are full of uh, software right so uh, machine learning model sitting down there and actuators are taking outputs from the machine learning model and then actually controlling the software um so the other thing is something like gene therapy um where you uh, modify the dna to cure some diseases and uh, this is highly relevant now right so this uh, one of the covid vaccines is a rna vaccine and uh, that's basically i mean that's that they cutting edge uh, research where they modify the rna according to some spec and they have a guarantee that uh, this rna is going to trigger an immune response in you when you inject the rna into the human body right or you are uh, building a um a software system for controlling power transmissions across uh, um the grid right this is uh, highly critical because uh, power grid is a critical infrastructure and uh, it's a complex problem because uh, the demand for power changes dynamically so you cannot have like one uh, um, one power station that's constantly sending out power and then uh, based on the demand uh, something automatically works you have to have like sophisticated control systems that ensure that uh, uh, the demand is met otherwise the whole grid uh, goes down but also make sure that when the demand is not there you are not doing uh, pushing stuff into the network right that is also a really uh, important thing and if you are doing that it's just a waste of energy and um, i mean today there is a lot of um, um, not in india but uh, in the europe there is a lot of software that controls the national grids the eu grids actually not just national grids. and how do you avoid disasters right if you think about these four uh, um, cases that i mentioned all of these have critical software in their um, mix and uh, if the software has bugs it causes it endangers lives right and uh, i mean if you talk to a, a person who is uh, not um, uh, say tech savvy and then you say okay your thing is uh, your software is controlled by this computer uh, you just uh, don't touch the steering wheel and you can just drive he is going to believe you but he is going to have the suspicion right how do i know that the software is not going to do something which will endanger my life right actually if if he asks the same question to you it is often the case that as we build software we don't have a answer as well because in the typical software development process we build software we test it we sort of say okay uh, i have reasonable confidence that the software does uh, something uh, uh, that matches my specification but you don't know what the corner cases are right and uh, this is not acceptable when it uh, endangers lives and in particular i'm not making these things up right so um few years ago i think this is not um uh, too old now so there is this uh, um new airplane called uh, boeing 737 max which is sort of an evolution of this boeing 737 right and uh, if you remember it was involved in two uh, major crashes right and uh, a lot of lives were lost in this process and these were not i mean this was october 2018 and uh, the other one was march 2019 so not far apart so there was a big uh, um, question asked on boeing is the flight safe all of these uh, 737 max um, flights were grounded right and then uh, boeing had to work through and uh, ensure that uh, there are fixes but if you look at uh, what the um uh, analysis that report of uh, causes was uh, it turns out that um, the cause was attributed to some designers 
in the flight um, uh, engines, right? Um, so in particular, uh, um, on the left hand side, what you have is a old 737, right? The engines were smaller. And in the 737 Max, the engines are much larger. If you look at it, uh, this is much larger. And the idea is this, right? This is just the thermodynamics. So if you sort of make, make the engines larger, you get more efficiency. And uh, people care about efficiency much more than uh, speed or something today, right? That efficiency is what sells. And uh, we had supersonic commercial jetliners, right? So we had Concorde uh, 40 years ago, right? And uh, Concorde is no more because it is not fuel efficient, but just really, really fuel inefficient and people were not willing to pay the price. So all the, basically Boeing and Airbus, right? Both of them sort of uh, said, okay, that is what people want. We'll build more and more efficient planes. And what uh, 737 Max does is it builds a larger engine, right? But the rest of the fuselage is the same size. The wing design and everything is the same. So <laughs> the thing is, uh, this red line that is underneath is, uh, sort of uh, the allowance that you have for fitting the engine under the wing, right? If you actually took this bigger engine and fit it under the wing, just as you would in an old 737, it just hits the ground. So you wouldn't be able to actually use the plane because the plane will hit the ground. And that's bad, right? We don't want a plane that sort of scrapes the ground as it uh, um, lifts off and touches down. So what they did, what the engineers did is uh, they came up with a clever solution. I mean, this is sort of what uh, people would come up with. They said, um, we will push the engine forward and a little bit up, right? So the position of the engine is actually uh, much more forward when compared to the old 730 design. And what this means is that uh, you could actually move the engine up and have clearance above the wing and then move it up a little bit so that it doesn't scrape the ground. And this was fine. What this meant is that uh, these engines, because they are a little bit in the front, but the future is the same, it created additional lift. So as you fly the plane, it creates additional lift. So your plane tends to go up all the time. So they had a uh, system, software system called uh, MCAS. It's called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. Um, and all it does is uh, there is an angle of attack sensor that is, sits on the outside of a plane. It's a small sensor that's like a triangle that you put on top of the plane. And that sort of knows, OK, what is the angle of attack? Angle of attack is uh, the angle between uh, the plane and the ground, right? So if the angle of attack is higher uh, due to this additional lift, then the software system sort of push it, pushes the plane down. This is automatic, right? This is not controlled by the humans. This is sort of a software that controls it. And um, these causes right, were attributed to two things. One was the faulty angle of attack sensor. Basically, the design of the sensor itself was a little bit broken. So it was giving wrong readings. But also the fact that uh, even though the sensor was sending wrong data, what um, the software does based on uh, this information was also incorrect. Right? The software had bugs. In particular, uh, Every time you switch this uh, MCA system off and on again, it acted like the first time, assuming that uh, the um, flight is uh, flying in a level level to the ground, right? So what was happening was this uh, in the crash, right? When they analyzed the black boxes, they were observing that uh, the plane was flying flat. And then uh, suddenly the plane sort of pushes its nose down. And in both of the crashes, it was going down. And the pilots desperately tried to pull it back. So it pulls back up, right? And it keeps going down again. And uh, what would you do as a natural thing, right? If my computer doesn't work or my, say, TV doesn't work, I just switch it off and on again. So that's what they did. The pilots sort of uh, switched the uh, angle of attack sensor data because they observed. I mean, these are trained pilots who know how to handle these cases. They observed that the sensor data was uh, incorrect and it was not getting processed properly. So they switch it off and on again. So imagine the plane is actually like this, and you switch it off and on again. And the, and the software system assumes that the plane is actually level down. Right? So if you again send some data, it pushes it even further down. So this kept every time the pilot switched it off and on again, it kept dipping down. Right? And this is sort of, you can sort of imagine this as um, um, 
the specification of the software did not uh, take into account what was happening before the software was uh, rebooted, right? Because you needed that information in order to sense the angle of attack. Every time, if you just assume that the plane was level when this system was switched on back again, you're going to cause uh, uh, bad things to happen, right? This is what I call incorrect spec, uh, not including history. The history was what the plane was doing when, uh, when the sensor was switched on and off. Uh, and uh, it was not being taken into account. The second issue was also a software issue. So during testing, right, the, this is an automated system, right? So this is not uh, supposed to widely change uh, what the plane was doing. So the max pitch adjustment that the system can do was 0.8 degrees, right? But uh, this was done during testing. And when they actually deployed it, they found that this was not sufficient. So after testing, they said, OK, we will change it to max 2.4 uh, uh, degrees angle of attack. And this compounded the problem, right? The execution condition, if you think about this as a software, you tested the software according to some specification, but you deployed it. And in production, the um, specifications were totally broken, right? Because you changed the setting to much more than what uh, was allowed under uh, uh, the testing. And uh, thirdly, this was uh, this is sort of uh, not taking into account the corner cases, right? The MTS sensor completely ignored that the pilots were desperately trying to pull back uh, the yoke. So they were trying to make sure that the plane was uh, level. But this angle of attack sensor did not take this into account. And it was still pushing uh, the nose down, right? And this is incorrect spec not considering the rest of the environment. So something is happening. You have feedback. Right, but uh, this was not uh, taken into account in the software. So all of this combined to cause uh, a big uh, issue, and uh, we lost uh, these two planes and uh, infinite amount of suffering. Right. So um, when you write software, you have to sort of uh, not every software that we write uh, is uh, is this critical. But uh, if you had to write this critical software, right, you really want uh, some guarantees. Right. We want to make sure that we sort of. Uh, um, issues are not uh, surfaced in production, right? And this is not an isolated incident. So there are lots and lots of incidents in the history. You can just Google for it. Here are some things that I found interesting. So uh, NASA had this Mars Climate Orbiter. I don't remember the exact date. This was sometime in the 90s. So uh, the idea was that uh, you send a spacecraft to Mars. It uh, it, it just goes around Mars and uh, make sure uh, it puts the uh, weather on Mars to Earth, right? And as NASA does, NASA is a government organization, right? But they can't do everything. So they sort of uh, outsource uh, um, parts of the systems to lots of different contractors, right? And this is by design so that they don't favor any one contractor. And one of the subcontractors on the engineering team failed to make a simple conversion from English units, the imperial units, which which America uses and Myanmar uses, I believe, but no other person in the world uses because that's not a sane system. To metric, right? Actually, NASA uses metric system, so the system that we all use, right? NASA uses metric system, but the subcontractor was using imperial system, and because they didn't make a um, this conversion, what had happened is that uh, at the orbital insertion stage. Uh, the orbit overshot Mars, and uh, you couldn't recover it, right? These systems are so tuned to carry the exact amount of fuel that if you miss the orbital insertion, that's it. The spacecraft is lost. So that $125 million, that's just the cost of the spacecraft. But there is so much embarrassment as well based on this report, right? If you sort of think about this, just uh, harking back to um, 3100, we saw that we could uh, sort of fix this by a GADT, right? We had a GADT where we sort of said, OK, uh, we, will, we will differentiate Kelvin from uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit, and we won't let you allow uh, computations between different units. These are known as units of measure, right? So um, that's an easy fix. I mean, in retrospect, uh, all of these, in hindsight, right, all of these fixes seem obvious, but uh, um, it is a fix that you hadn't thought about earlier, right? That sort of really causes uh, these problems. The other uh, 
example is this area and five flight software so area and five is a uh, european space agency's uh, rocket engine right so that's the workhorse uh, area and five is incredibly reliable um, so before slv that we have uh, today and uh, it proved its metal uh, india builds the satellites these large insat satellites right weather monitoring satellites and then ships it over to french guyana where uh, they shoot it off into space as arian fly five fly this is the first flight of uh, arian five if i remember right that's why it's called 501 so the software had uh, multiple computers right and one was a 64 bit computer another was a 16 bit uh, computer it had to send a floating point number from 64 bit to 16 bit and uh, it tried to cram the 64 bit into 16 bit the obviously the thing overflowed and uh, the control software uh, sent the rocket in the wrong direction and it it just exploded uh, on launch and 500 million dollar payload lost and lots and lots of uh, money more money to fix the flaw right identify the flaw and fix the flaw so again this was last year's thing so there was news where um, people in hawaii got uh, all of the people in hawaii got texts on their phone said uh, there is a missile strike that is imminent go take shelter right every alarm system went off and like imagine this right so we know that uh, this was this was during the time when north korea was uh, also saber rattling they were launching missiles and so on and uh, when you get this message what do you think right i just need to make sure that uh, me and my family and my friends are safe so i will see what i can do it turns out that this was a false alarm and uh, the uh, report based on that uh, uh, mentioned this uh, thing right so this was quote from the report which said there were troubling design flaws in the uh, emergency management alert system uh, origination software right so this was also a software bug and uh, yeah this is one more thing so equifax had a social security number hack where 143 million of their customer records including name social security number which is like the tax number right pan pan number uh, the credit card numbers were stolen by attackers again a security flaw and, and there are lots and lots of flaws uh, software flaws in this space right so some are uh, some endanger lives others endanger financial security uh, i could keep on talking about this forever right but uh, the thing to realize is that software does control our lives uh, more and more so and uh, there are some critical systems where we depend on software and uh, we want to ensure that somehow the software systems are more secure right so i am not going to claim that uh, program verification is the only solution for this problem right so there are lots and lots of uh, uh, techniques across the spectrum starting from less formal ones where uh, the techniques may miss problems including code reviews pair programming and so on uh, there are others where you have uh, methodical ways of ensuring that the software does not uh, build uh, flaws into the design something like uh, design patterns use the design pattern make sure that uh, you avoid a lot of the problems bug tracking version control software test driven development and so on there are also more formal ones including technological uh, things like uh, static analysis and fuzzers um, so you can sort of think of um, the type system for ocaml or java as uh, some static analysis right and uh, down at the bottom we have mathematical driven validation approaches uh, including formal verification system right so we are going to focus on formal verification in this course but that doesn't mean that you have to always use formal verification all of these techniques are important right but um, the formal spec sort of guides all of the uh, things about right if i am testing for some specification in the software i need to be able to build up a specification i need to be able to express the specification informally or formally right and all of these sort of come from um, uh, the notion of formal verification um and of course the cost of uh, doing these right increases as you go down so code reviews and pair programming are much cheaper than actually going ahead and verifying your software formally as you will see in this course right we will verify very simple things but we will observe that the cost the effort that you have to put in to verify these things are uh, um, much higher than the amount you, effort you put to develop the software 
okay so zeroing in on verification so verification scaled to tens of lines of code in the 1970s right so back in the day it was uh, it was an intellectual curiosity people verified very small lines of code it was not practical but today it scales to real software right so um, comcert is a verified c compiler that is built uh, using one of the softwares that uh, uh, we will study in this course uh, scl4 is a verified microkernel operating system right and uh, scl4 came out of a research project in uh, uh, nikta which is an australian research institute and uh, it is used i mean lots in lots of, lots of places including um, the f35 fighter jets right they use scl4 and uh, why not is a verified database management uh, system with web services and so on there is also more recent projects like uh, project everest which is built with uh, another software that we will study in this course project everest is a project from microsoft research the goal is to build verified uh, https stack from ground up right and the idea is that uh, everything that we do on the internet right we we depend on the internet for a lot of things and all of these uh, depend on the security of the protocols that we use but as you know um, the older protocols right like ssl and so on are uh, protocols are fine but the implementations of uh, the software happen to be in c and c is not a software that you want to write verified code in right and there are lots and lots of software bugs which compromise um financial information let's just leave it at that right they also compromise a lot of other things but project everest is this project which uh, builds verified uh, software stacks for uh, https and pieces of those are already used in uh, the windows operating system and also uh, the mozilla browser so if you are if you are joining this call from mozilla you are uh, you are using bits of these verified software right and you will see what those verified pieces of software are and how we can construct those in this course and you can imagine right this is uh, this was i mean this is good progress for uh, 40 years right and imagine where we can be in 40 years and that's the sort of things that uh, uh, we will see in this course uh, sort of you can you can a lot of the things that you will see are uh, sort of cutting edge in this course very practical as well you might uh, we might only scratch the surface but uh, increasingly the trend is going towards that area right so this course will equip you with the uh, skills to ask the questions that will become critical in the next decade right 40 years is pushing it but uh, uh, in the next decade so okay so that's the verification bit so we will look at uh, certain pieces of software right I said uh, um, when you when you say you write a, a binary search tree deletion, you have some specification in your mind, right? And you say, okay, these cases are obvious, these cases are not obvious. So I'm going to do something by writing a proof by hand, right? But um, proving things by hand is incredibly uh, messy and uh, error prone, right? Humans are not good at handling multiple things at the same time. So we have a software uh, tool stack known as proof assistance. So this is a common term. And what proof assistance help you to do is to say, OK, here is a theorem that I want to prove. right? So you sort of say, here is a theorem, the proof assistant. And what you do is you work in collaboration with the proof assistant to find the proof for that uh, theorem. right? And the uh, human actually has to be in the loop. He has to guide the construction of the proof but a lot of the low level details, including maintaining, say, several uh, tens of uh, sub goals that you need to prove, all of that low level handling is taken care of by the software. right? And uh, there are lots and lots of proof assistants, including COC, UPRL, Isabel Hall, and so on. We are going to study COC in this course. right? That's the thing that we will study. And it sort of informs uh, how other software is also built. They are all built on the same similar uh, technique. So COC is a software that was first, uh, it's, it's a bit old, right? So it's not, uh, um, um, it's proven it's uh, metal. <laughs> let's uh, let's not call it old. It's proven it's uh, metal uh, over the years. It was first implemented in uh, 1984. And uh, 
it is implemented using OCaml, right? There is OCaml that is actually powering Cork. So you'll see a lot of commonalities between uh, OCaml and uh, the things that you do in Cork. Um, surprisingly so, right? And uh, I mean, it's it's continually in development and uh, it sort of underlies a lot of critical software uh, that we use today. And uh, what happens in a Cork uh, program, the way you interact with it is uh, you, so I said program verification, right? So what 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 do we do? We actually write a program in COP, right? There is some program for which we want to prove certain things. Let's say uh, I want to prove that uh, uh, binary search tree deletion actually does the correct thing. So you will actually implement a binary search tree in uh, COP. So using a language within COP called uh, Kalina, it's a functional programming language, a pure functional programming language. You will describe that uh, program. And uh, you will also write theorems over the program, right? Let's say if I delete a particular node from an empty binary search tree, uh, you just get an empty binary search tree. That would be, say, one particular lemma in your uh, um, proof. You will include that in um, along with the program. And uh, what you do as a um, human that is interacting with the proof assistant is that uh, you sort of guide the proof. You sort of work with the proof assistant to construct the proof for why that particular uh, uh, theorem holds for the given program, right? That is what we'll do. And uh, at the end of it, what you get is uh, you can extract a verified OCaml program from it. So we built this program for binary history in Cork. You can get a OCaml program. And the guarantee that you have is that uh, the extracted program satisfies all the theorems that you've proved, right? Any proof of the theorem that is actually um, proved holds for this OCaml program. So that is a way to build reliable software and plug it into um, things that you may want to do. Okay, so that's the interaction story. So this is not just programming. As you will see, you will be interacting with uh, the software by writing programs, but you will interact with it in an interesting way. Right? So I found it interesting at least. And uh, the way you will interact with it is uh, write the program with uh, what are known as tactics. We'll come back to what these tactics are, but that's what you'll do. At the end of the day, you'll extract uh, OCaml programs from it. So that is uh, proof assistance, where you sort of uh, uh, build the proof manually. There is also this other way of doing proofs, right? Uh, starting with uh, SAT servers back in uh, 60s, uh, SAT solvers have been augmented with theories about uh, data types and uh, um, integers and floating points and bit strings and so on. So they have become very powerful today. So what you can do is uh, you give the um, the automated theorem proving engine a theorem that you want to prove, right? And uh, what this engine will do is it either finds a proof, right? It says, okay, here's a proof, or it finds a counterexample to that proof, or it may time out because these uh, techniques are sort of um, Heuristic driven because these uh, um, these are complex theories. So you might uh, find that uh, uh, the automated theorem prover coming back to you saying, "I just tried for a while. I tried everything that was under my uh, with the tools that I have. I just can't either find a proof or disprove it. Right? I have timed out. So can you provide more information? Is what uh, this uh, automated theorem proving technique will do." And uh, examples are uh, the Z3 SMT um, solver that is sort of from Microsoft Research, right? And uh, you should you should Google Z3. It's just uh, proven to be incredible software in the last uh, 20 years, and uh, it has made uh, life uh, much better in Windows, right? Uh, and also lots of other places. There is also this other. Uh, um, theorem prover called ACL2, which was used to verify AMD chip, chip compliance with uh, IEEE floating point specification. So one of the early Intel chips, I forget what uh, this one was. So they had a bug in the implementation of a floating point uh, division. So if you did floating point in uh, uh, this Intel processor, you'll get wrong errors, uh, uh, wrong answers, which uh, does not correspond to the floating point, IEEE floating point uh, specification, right? 
and that was uh, that was called the F Div pub. So it was it happened to do with uh, division, and uh, Intel spent lots and lots of money in order to fix that flaw because they had sold all these units. They had to recall it. They had to fix the bug. They had to fab this U processor and then ship it out. It was a big disaster for them. So AC2 was used to verify uh, AMD, particular AMD chip compliance with the IEEE floating point uh, specification. What we will do in this course, the second thing that we will do in this course is study this language called FSTAR. And uh, FSTAR is also very much like OCaml, right? It's a functional programming language. It is general purpose functional programming language, right? You can do stuff that you can do with uh, OCaml. In addition to what you can do with OCaml, you can also do quite uh, fancy things, including proof theorems, right? Proof complicated theorems using Z3 solver that is sitting underneath. So that's an automated theorem proving engine that is sitting underneath, where you can say, I think this holds for binary search tree. See if you can prove it, right? And uh, FSTAR will come back and say, OK, I proved it for you. You know that this particular function uh, holds. Or it may just come back and say, uh, I found a counter example, or uh, I find out. We will look at uh, FSTAR as well. So there are basically two different ways of uh, doing program verification, right? So there, there is this deductive verification, which is uh, where you sort of work with the proof assistant to build the proofs um, from scratch, essentially. And then uh, there is a star driven one, which has a SMT solver underneath. And the solver will take complex questions and may come up with an answer very quickly. And for a lot of these questions, it will, right? You just need to understand how to build these proofs. Um, build these theorems in a way that uh, SMT solvers can uh, solve it. And that's what we will do in this uh, uh, second part of the course. Yeah, so I just mentioned that. Again, FSTA is a very, very active project. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, if you if you learn FSTA uh, today, it can be um, quite useful in the coming years. Um, in particular, programs can be extracted to OCaml, F sharp programming language, which is like a functional programming language that runs on the .NET platform. You can actually extract C code, right? You have to write it into this uh, subset of FSTAR, but you can extract C code, and the guarantee that you have is that C code is correct, right? C code does not have memory errors. C code does not have uh, other safety issues that uh, uh, you have with typical C code. You can also extract it to WebAssembly, uh, WebAssembly is this uh, new um, language, right? a low-level execution engine that is in every browser that we have. So earlier, it used to be the case that uh, browsers can only run JavaScript. And JavaScript is a like terrible target language for a compiler. right? It's a high-level language. So WebAssembly is a low-level um, low machine where you can compile languages like C or OCaml or Haskell or Java or something into WebAssembly, and it can run it much more efficiently. And you can also extract FSTAR verified programs directly into assembly code for very fast executions. This is not required for all the time, but uh, you can also extract x86 code if you want it. We will probably look at OCaml extraction, but not uh, anything else. Uh, so yeah, so as I mentioned, Project Everest is the project under which this language is being developed. So they have developed a drop-in replacement for the HTTPS stack, right? And they have verified implementation of uh, TLS, which is the transport layer security protocol, which is the successor of the SSL protocol. When you type HTTPS, S means security, right? And that is uh, that corresponds to these uh, protocols. And they have a verified implementation of those. It's a massive uh, achievement, right? And uh, this was done thanks to FSTAR. So you can do non-trivial programs. You can build non-trivial programs with FSTAR. You will only scratch the surface, but uh, you will uh, you will see that uh, uh, the potential for doing some of this is uh, enormous. OK, in the remaining time, uh, I'll just quickly go through this course. So, yeah, so the goal of the course, as I mentioned, is provide mathematical foundation for rigorous analysis of realistic software systems. right? And uh, in particular, what we will do is uh, we will develop the formal foundations for uh, expressing program correctness, right? And we will also study, in particular, the Kopf proof assistant in FSTAR programming language, where you can take these formal specifications and actually show that the program 
corresponds to these specifications. And uh, you may ask why bother with proof assistance? As I said, uh, um, pen and paper proofs, proofs are outdated, right? So these systems are so complicated that uh, informal reasoning about uh, program correctness is just doesn't fly. Humans are just terrible at writing proofs. I mean, there have been several published uh, papers uh, recently where, uh, I mean, not very recently, maybe 10 years ago, where uh, the proof was incorrect. So they proved uh, some interesting property about some system, but the proofs were incorrect. It was just hard to catch these because no fault of uh, the authors, right? These are just incredibly complex invariants that uh, you cannot uh, uh, do with pen and paper informal reasoning. So proof assistants help you uh, do these uh, things in a methodical way. There is no hand waving anymore. And uh, essentially for this course, right? Proof assistant means I have one TA per student. So all of the assignments in this uh, course will be go write this uh, program, right? And go prove this theorem. I won't even have a look at your solution. If you just happen to convince the proof assistant or F star that the proof holds, I don't care how you got to the proofs, right? So it is, it just makes my life so much easier. But also this is very important, right? If you write a proof, informal paper proof, I can have a look at it, but it's just impossible for me to um, verify that uh, your proof is correct because, because people do things differently, right? So the homework for today is to watch this talk, right? The slides are already up on the website. You should watch this talk by Benjamin Pierce, who is one of the one of the professors. Actually, you know Benjamin Pierce. He is the one who wrote the Types and Programming Languages, book, which was the one of the uh, textbooks that was suggested for CS3100. Uh, he's a professor in UPenn, and uh, he does a lot of work with uh, Cobb. Um, and you should watch the video, right? It's a it's an interesting way of uh, thinking about uh, teaching programming languages. That's what we'll do in this course. And uh, in terms of the course contents, we'll start with uh, mathematical logic, right? Fundamentals of logic. So logic in CS is essentially the same as uh, calculus in the other disciplines, right? That is fundamental thing that uh, sort of uh, uh, underlies everything that we do in computer science. And uh, I mean, of course, you've taken logic courses and so on. We'll just refresh it in the context of doing that in uh, uh, Coq, right? And uh, we will look at some functional programming, assuming that some of you um, will cover basic concepts. We know all of this, but we'll cover it anyway, very quickly. And we will also look at uh, what does it mean to write a specification? And what does it mean to verify something according to the specification? Right? All of this will we'll do. In the course of this, you will also learn a lot of programming language theory, right? Because uh, as you expand uh, the systems, things that you want to prove become very complicated. So you will develop a lot of mechanisms in order to make it easier for us to fit the complex system into a framework. You will study a lot of topics. We'll slowly go through each of these topics, right? And uh, and you'll see why these topics are important. Uh, yeah, lectures will be mostly developing programs and proofs interactively in Coq and F-star. So I'll just open a Coq a proof assistant and start uh, uh, doing things there, right? I'll have slides some in some places, but really it's going to be programming, live programming, right? And uh, yeah, you are encouraged to follow along as well. I will make sure that I post uh, the source files uh, um, before the lecture, and you can follow it along uh, as you hear the lecture, right? And um, yeah, OCaml portions are prerequisite, soft prerequisite, let me put it that way, right? So. It's OK if you don't have everything in the tip of your uh, finger. And uh, there will be weekly assignments, right? Uh, I expect it to consume 8 to 10 hours. In the last uh, offering, some people did it in one hour. Some people took much, much longer. So it really depends on uh, uh, how you get to the solutions. But anyway, so uh, we will start with very easy ones. So that you sort of ramp up, right? And then we'll we'll get uh, to more complex ones. I'll make sure that there are enough uh, um, help and TA help as well. The TAs are also have also taken this course, so you can poke them as well. 
TAs are very good. So I don't uh, think the TAs are here. But they are very good. They they can ensure that uh, all of your questions are answered. Well. I am also always available, right? I'll create a course Slack as well, and we'll uh, ensure that uh, your questions are answered. Um, collaboration is encouraged, right? This is a small class. Talk to each other, find out the ways of doing proofs and so on. Yeah, feel free, right? Um, don't copy proofs. Right? I am not uh, going to check whether you are copying, right? I just, uh, um, yeah, it's not worth my time because you might just arrive at the same uh, uh, proof structure. But uh, I really want you to like, try this, right? Um, yeah, if I do find uh, plagiarism, I'm just going to apply the institute policy. And uh, yeah, sixty percent for assignments, twenty percent midterm and twenty percent final. You will uh, the midterm and the final will also take home. They will also be glorified programming assignments, right? You'll be given some small assignment. The last time I gave twenty-four hours for the assignment, they'll be small. They won't be too difficult. Um, and uh, and yeah, everything that you do in this course will be on a computer. Okay. Um, yeah, you will need assistance. My calendar is there. I will also open a Slack uh, thing and uh, don't use email. We'll just uh, uh, coordinate on Slack. And uh, yeah, exams will be take home. Yeah, the course website is there. Topics and announcements are there. Uh, give me lots of feedback, right? I know this is a different uh, uh, sort of a course. Um, the level of the material might be easy or difficult. Last time, it was difficult for a select group of people, but the others found it very, very easy. Um, I always, uh, if you give me feedback, right, I'm happy to adjust the um, course delivery according to uh, how it would best fit the class. So if I don't get feedback, I'm going to assume that you're learning everything. right? If I get feedback, I'm happy to uh, change the way I'm uh, offering I'm, I'm going through uh, the lectures. This is, I, I wrote this, but I'm, I, I don't know whether I'm sort of uh, fully agree. This is not an easy course, but that doesn't mean this is uh, going to be a difficult uh, course that uh, you don't enjoy, right? It is going to be difficult, but uh, if you talk to the people who had taken the course previously, it is quite enjoyable. It is actually quite addictive, right? My recommendation is uh, these assignments are very, very addictive. Uh, make sure you take care of your health as well, right? Don't just sit and do these assignments for like eight hours straight, right? Uh, take breaks. Uh, most of the assignments will be finding up, uh, finding out uh, interesting invariants, and then uh, just the proof will go through. As much time as spent on the computer, go think about it offline. Just think on walks and such. Uh, such. Uh, it is much more uh, fun that way rather than you. Just randomly trying out things on the computer. Um, yeah, so it's it's a it's a very addictive course, and it may prove to be time-consuming. So if you find that you're not making progress, my suggestion is to step back and go take a walk. I'm sure you'll find an answer very quickly, right? Um, yeah. So there is a textbook uh, from Adam Shipala called uh, "Formal Reasoning About Programs." It's really available. The textbook is essentially um, some introduction to the materials that we will cover in this course. The textbook is uh, just a PDF. It's freely available. There is no recommended text for this one. If you study formal reasoning or problem, if you sort of look at what I teach in the class, you don't need to read the textbook. Right? I leave it at that. You can read it for extra um, clarifications and such. I'm not going to ask anything that I don't teach in class. Right, so um, if you don't read the textbook, that's fine. I put it out there because uh, because it does exist a textbook, and there will be no textbook for the F star. There is a tutorial. We will also cover a lot of material on F star, and uh, I'm sure uh, those will be enough. again. There are lots of talks and tutorials. You don't need to see any of those. If you attend my lectures, that should be fine for uh, solving the assignments and the answer. That's all I have. Actually. Uh, I took a little bit of your time. Any questions on uh, what I've uh, mentioned so far?
Any questions at all? There'll be weekly assignments. I, I think uh, I'll start releasing the assignments after I teach a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, but it'll be a, it'll be a lot of fun. It's, it's going to be very addictive, right? So I think you'll enjoy going through this course. No questions? OK. So in that case, uh, what I'll do is uh, I will create a Slack uh, uh, group. I will share the information on Moodle. And then join the Slack group. I'm usually on Slack. Um, and you can, uh, yeah, you can join and uh, ask me questions. And also have the TAs there. And uh, feel free to poke uh, either me or TA for uh, um, the um, anything that you have issues with. Right? Um, yeah. Don't expect me to respond uh, like a few hours before the deadline, because I won't. But if you have questions, uh, Say one day before, I'm happy to answer. OK, in that case, I'll just stop here. Right? So I'm happy that you all showed up. Uh, and uh, we'll have fun through this course. right? Uh, don't worry about the grades. right? So I think uh, because it's a small class, we'll make sure that everyone learns. Um, yeah, if uh, I don't know whether I'm going to follow absolute grading, but if all of you get, uh, say, 100% on everything, I'm happy to give everyone an S. Right? So this is. Or say more than 90 90 90 percent. I'm happy to give everyone an S. So this is uh, this is going to be a really fun course. So let's uh, let's leave it at that. Good. So thank you very much, everyone. Talk to you. Talk to you through the rest of the weeks. Bye bye. Thanks, Casey. Bye. Bye.